thank you very much for joining us for the September session of the Excellence in Breeding GOBI webinar series today. And we are fortunate to have a speaker, speaker Dr. Moira Sheehan, who will tell us about the Breeding Insight Project and its work on software and data management solutions. Before we begin, I wanted to let everyone know that we will be recording this seminar and we will make it available later for anyone who may want to access it. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to share them through the chat window and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions directly to, to Moira after she presents. And before we proceed with the presentation, I'd just like to take a moment to thank and introduce our speaker, Dr. Moira Sheehan. Moira started her education in biology as an undergraduate at Virginia Tech. She continued her studies at the Boyce Thompson Institute at Cornell University. There, she worked with Dr. Thomas Brutnell, studying phytochrome genes in maize for her PhD research. Moira remained at Cornell for her postdoc, where she continued to work with maize before she moved on to a job at Nature Source Improved Plants in 2010. She was a research scientist and project manager there for over eight years before she became the director of the Breeding Insight Project in 2019. We'd like to thank Moira for participating in our seminar series today and for sharing information with all of us about the Breeding Insight Project. So, thank you. Thank you, Kate, and thank you everybody for attending. Uh, there's a lot of new names here that I don't, uh, I haven't recognized, so I, I've probably not met most of you. So I thought, um, I wasn't really sure of what kind of audience we'd have. So I hope that you'll be, everybody will find something interesting in today's talk. Um, can you see my title screen? Okay. Yes. Okay, so first I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about breeding for specialty crops and animals, because I think that for many of you, you may not be thinking about it um, the way the USDA is thinking about these kinds of um, species. And then because I'm, I'm not sure that any of you really know me or know Breeding Insight, I'd like to talk a little bit about what Breeding Insight is about, um, our mission and our pilot program. And then in the, at the very end, talk a little bit about where we see us going next, okay? <clears throat> so just as an example of a couple of common species that we know are being bred widely across the world and also in the US, talking about beef, cattle, and chicken, um, corn or maize, and soybean. So these are massive industries that are producing, um, just on this one example here, more than $200 billion per year in the US alone. So these are well-funded, well, funded, well uh, good pipelines, they have good production from farm to table, and, um, and various other downstream uses. So the spoiler alert is these are not specialty crops or animals, okay? So what do I mean when I say specialty animals? Well, it's things like honeybees, or aquaculture like oysters, or other types of fisheries, and things like llamas and alpacas. And when I talk about specialty crops, what does that mean? Well, there's more than 300 specialty crops, and if you break it down by human usage, you'll recognize most of these species. So a lot of it is landscape and decorative, so Christmas trees or shrubs, um, even turf grass. Uh, some of it is human health related, so like echinacea or foxglove. Some of it's horticultural, like maple syrup production. Uh, there's the fruit trees and the nut trees. And also vegetables, your squash, your broccoli, your carrots. And culinary herbs and spices like mint or you know, other kinds of spices. And that all really falls under human nutrition. So by use, you know and touch these things every day in your life. And you probably don't think that much about it. They're just there on the shelves at the grocery store. They're in your pantry or they're in your refrigerator, and somehow they get to you. Well, I want to come back to this major species thing again. So most of it, the advanced breeding and investment has been focused on about 15 total species. That's animals and plants. And yet we rely on agricultural products for more than just food. We rely on it for nutritious foods, uh, fruits and veggies, uh, better so different sources of protein that are maybe non-animal based, um, ecosystem services and carbon capture. And also we use them for fuel and polymers and also for fibers. So if we really are serious about creating global food security 
and alternative sources for any of these uses here, it requires that we start breeding for hundreds of species and not 15. So Breeding Insight's mission really is to transform breeding by enabling the implementation of genomic insight and selection as part of routine breeding programs all across ARS. And right now we're just in a pilot phase. So we've started with six pilot specialty species. They're shown here on the right. And we've spent that first year really meeting with each of our breeders on location and understanding their needs and wants. And then we worked with them to provide resources and, and make connections that allow them access to gen, uh, gen, gen, genotyping platforms and providers uh, of data management solutions. We also help them with high throughput phenotyping and managing that type of data. And we provide hands-on consultation support as they transition from um, uh, one, one type of program into one that has more genomics involved. And we also deliver software, considering what publicly available components are already out in the uh, sphere. And we also look at the functionality each of our breeder specified use cases brings to the table. By connecting those different programs in the back end seamlessly, we can overlay that with an intuitive species specific user interface that's friendly for breeders. Okay. Our BI team is really conduct, um, constructed from three different types of uh, expertise realms. And the first is our science team, and that's led by SIBA, our program manager. And as you can see, we have a genomics and a bioinformatics coordinator, and we're still looking for a phenomics coordinator. So if you're interested, please let me know. Um, and their job is to really interface with the breeders um, on a very personal and almost weekly basis to help them with their technology adoption. And then we also have our extensive dev team, which is doing all of the backend RAPI connections. They're doing the interface design and the database management creation. And that's led by our lead developer, Tim Parsons. And then uh, our admin and comms is really just uh, kind of the big picture of the program. And um, Kristen and Vanessa's our comms lead really are instrumental in, in doing that kind of outreach. So a central tenant of BI is really know your breeders. And what I mean by that is when you're dealing with specialty crops, you're probably gonna be dealing with specialty challenges. So some things that I am give examples for are specific kinds of logistical challenges. They have sometimes very long generation cycles or specialized propagation methods. Um, inventory for specialty species is more than just seeds. Um, there's often a lack of surplus budget to upgrade or expand because these are smaller programs. They don't have billions of dollars of funding behind it. And often the workforce is very small or nimble. There's also technical challenges. Um, there's a, hot, a flooded high throughput phenotyping uh, marketplace out there and many breeders who want to take up new technologies do not know where to start. Um, there's a lot of heterogeneous historical data and not all of it's really valuable. So figuring out what needs to be kept and what doesn't is, is a challenge for a breeder to, to tackle. They have need for remote data collection, sometimes in extreme environments. Some of these, fishy, these fish net pens are out in very cold um, ocean waters and you do not want to have something that's not water resistant out there. And in general, they, both, they all kind of lack genetic data and resources or access to providers. And there's other challenges too, like biological challenges. So just to give you an overview of all the types of biological challenges and, and other kinds of challenges we're dealing with, um, we've got blueberry with uh, 4X and 6X genomes, long generation time, and very few tools or, or trait data available. Alfalfa is also an auto tetraploid, um, no genetic tools, and it's completely different cultivation system. It's planted for four, three to five years and harvested multiple times per year. Um, in our fisheries, we have uh, diploids, but the genetic markers are either very high cost to, to genotype or non-existent. And 80% of the traits they're collecting are lethal. So that changes how you're going to run your breeding program if you can't breed with the same individuals that you're phenotyping. We also work with sweet potato, um, another complex genome, uh, very few genetic tools, it's highly heterozygous and it's clonally propagated. And last, uh, table grape, it's another diploid but it's highly heterozygous and wild vines can be either male or female, not just hermaphroditic and keeping, we need a system that can keep track of that 
And if you're making table grapes, you want uh, seedless products. So that also puts a complication in how you're going to breed forward to get new varieties when you don't want seeds in your varieties. So what we've done is after we assess each of our programs, we kind of put them in these little buckets, okay? So um, for most of them, you can see they're sitting in phenotypic selection. So they're relying mostly on their breeder's knowledge and very little on the genetics, maybe a little bit of pedigree information, but not much more. And then in the next box, we have marker-assisted selection. So this is where breeder's knowledge is being paired with some genetic information. Might not be a lot, it could just be a couple of disease markers or whatever, but it's, it's definitely being informed, those decisions are being informed by that genetics. And then we have the last bucket, which is genomic selection. And right now only our rainbow trout really fits into that bucket. And that's where the breeder's knowledge is less important than what the genetics are telling you you want from the system. And at each of these, you'll see triangles that are labeled with BTE. That means that, that for alfalfa to move to the next stage, there are barriers to entry, both you know, logistical, technical, biological. Um, it limits their program growth and uh, technology adoption. So our job at BI is to really lower those barriers as much as possible and to guide them into the next step up this ladder. And I'm going to take a slight digression for a moment because I'm, I'm going to present this the way the breeders present it to us. They will, a lot of those phenotypic selection groups are saying, but it's really important. My breeder's eye is really good. It's really useful. And they're right. It had, most of the progress we've made as humans in breeding animals and plants was done through eye by phenotypic selection. There is no question about that. And it is easy to adopt, but it's very hard to perfect. It takes years to perfect that. So new breeders oftentimes want to jump out of that requirement and try to use more genetics and more modern technologies to make their breeding decisions. So the next question I get from breeders that are in breeding for phenotypic selection is, well, why should I add genomics? Well, the, the reasons why is like sequencing technology used to be inaccessible and not affordable for most species, but that's changed. And we also know a lot more about genomes and transcriptomes, and that, that knowledge is growing every day. Breeders are using a lot of information that they're collecting and having to assimilate and act upon in short windows of time, but they have fixed constraints to do that. There's not that much time or, or to spend thinking about it. And breeders don't get to see if they were right until it's really too late to change course. You don't want to know you've made a bad cross in year four when you've gone out for yield trials. That would, that's a big waste of time and energy. So what, we, what I tell them is that by supplementing your breeder's eye with genomic data, analytics, and prediction models, we can free them from that grunt work and reduce uncertainty in the program's constraints, within the program's constraints, so they can get back to doing what they do best, which is more breeding. So I'm not going to talk about all this, but if you're wondering how does it, what does it take to move up this ladder, there's a lot of things that we're looking for as milestones to show that we're making progress towards um, this. And really BI is sitting right here in this purple box. We're trying to make a massive leap forward with proven tools and methods, technologies and vendors, software and training, along with that consultation, curation and mentorship from our coordinators. So now we've convinced them, yes, they want to put genomics into their, they want to start doing something with genomics data in their programs. So what do they really need to make good progress? Well, they need to manage a breeding program. They need to know when, when to plant, when to harvest, when pesticides have to be applied, etc. They also need to collect data in remote locations, so they need tools to do that. They need to store the trait data they've collected off those tools so that they can use it later. And they, when they want to collect samples, they need to manage how they're collecting and for what an analyses they're going for. Our crop breeders really want to have access to the USDA's germplasm banks as a source of pre-breeding materials. Um, they need to generate and store genetic data. And then they need to bring the genetic data and the trait data together to make a ge genomic analyses and then make use decision support services and do better reporting about what they're doing on a yearly basis. And so the one way we've uh, approached this at Breeding Insight is we recognize that as humans, they're following a 12-month calendar cycle. All of our breeders are doing things 
um, you know, salmon is spawned actually in November. So that's the, the initiation of their breeding cycle. In trout, it starts in February. But regardless, that cycle is still a 12 month cycle of planning and activities. So if we look at what's, what's happening in that 12 month cycle, we are trying to support a digital ecosystem that handles and takes care of all of these key points that are milestones within that 12 month calendar year. So the ability to manage stocks and pedigrees, uh, perform crosses, design and manage trials, capture phenotypes in the field, whether that's on pen and paper or vocal cap capture or a tablet. They need to collect and evaluate genotypes and then evaluate it with phenotypes and then use that information to make decisions and selections and to generate reports that are required. So Breeding Insight is really trying to pull all of these different functionalities into one unified system. And the, the beauty of this digital ecosystem and, and functioning is that even though I'm showing it for plants, it's not that different for, for animals. So the one thing that you'll see here that is different is managing animal welfare, which I won't talk about today. It also looks very similar for our honeybees. So the nice thing about approaching it from a human aspect is that we can make sure that the software is responsive to the workflows of the breeder at a timely way. Okay. All right, so you've convinced your breeders. Now they've said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna dive into the data management sphere. What do I start with? And it's a dizzying array of public software that's available out there for, for them to use. And for most, this is where it stops. They see this and they're just like, I don't, I don't know what to do next. There's just too much out there. Um, I, I don't know why I'd use one versus another. So we've decided by, to reduce some of that search space by picking a few um, technologies that meet our needs in Breeding Insight. So our initial platform uh, will use BreedBase as the um, phenotypic data management, breeding management software. We're going to be using Fieldbook for our remote data collection, Gobi for our genetic and genomic analyses, and then also connecting to Green Global as a source for pre-breeding materials for the breeding programs that require it. And we're doing this all through the interoperability BRAPI standards. Um, where, where the standard falls short, we're helping to create out new endpoints to meet our needs. And I'll come back to this in a little bit. I did want to spend a, a few moments just talking about our design approach. So we're really focused on ease of use. This needs to be breeder friendly and it needs to be context sensitive and in the interface, which means if it's March and they know they need to be setting up their, uh, getting their crosses ready, that's what they should be seeing. It also is process centric because we want it to coordinate it and work with existing breeder workflows. Our discovery process is really dedicated to understanding each of the specifics of the program needs and de designed directly for individual specialty crops and animals. And we want it to be customized to the breeder workflow and, and program activities. And lastly, our priority for interconnectivity is the ability to share data across software tools. So we don't need one whole program that does everything. We can connect and pass data along as we need to by using several different pieces of component software. So I have a couple of screenshots here just to show of what our software looks like right now. Um, this is uh, for trait management. Um, on the left, you can see that there's a list of traits the breeder is interested in, in curating and keeping in their um, program. If you want to get more detail, you can actually uh, click on a, you know, expanded view within that same list. So you can have, you don't have to switch uh, screens for that. And it will show uh, the rubric for whatever scale is being, you know, uh, that is associated with that trait. And there's also a method for creating new traits on the fly. And this is one of the things we found from all of our breeders, especially specialty breeders, because they're always trying to find new niche markets. And so they want to be able to create new traits as soon as they see something that might be interesting or, or uh, have some good heritability. We also have some uh, screenshots of our program management. So the ability to manage your locations, the ability to manage and add users, and also very clear messaging when you've completed an action. So showing that, yes, you were able to add successfully that new user to your program. 
we're in the process of developing a public sandbox site. So this would be a, um, a sandbox site that allow, allows anybody who wants to download the software to run it on their own, to also um, play around with the different screens, to give us feedback on what's working and what's not. And we also have a coordinator. So this would be BI internal coordinator sandbox site. And the, the, the slight difference between this is this allows a little bit more administrative actions for the co coordinators who are going to act as the as the breeder uh, proxy in the interim before the breeders really start using the software on their own. So I wanted to come back again to the targeted software integrations because I think it's really important to stress why we're, why we're making the decisions we're making. So as I mentioned, we're using Brappy. And the reason for this is that we're hoping we can use this in the future to connect to a lot of different things that we currently cannot have, uh, access. So our first integration that we tackled was allowing Fieldbook and Breedbase to talk to each other in the back end without the need for file transfer. And the integration that we created will work for any BRAPI compliant phenomics database system. So if BMS is BRAPI compliant, you can use this same integration with BMS. Um, if B4R is BRAPI compliant, you can use it with B4R. So just a couple of screenshots of what this looks like. You can load your field data right in from Breedbase directly onto your uh, Android tablet. You can collect your phenotypes out in the field. And then when you're ready to export it back out, you can directly put it into the database and you get a small, uh, a short export report of what, was, uh, what actually is going on uh, to the database. And if you're interested, you can find this uh, integration in uh, Fieldbook 4.1 or higher. Okay. So again, talking about flexibility, because we're making BRAPI our standard, if someone is coming into the program and already uses GDR and it's BRAPI compliant, then we don't ask them to change to Breedbase. They can still use GDR. Or if they're using BMS and it's BRAPI compliant, they can use that with uh, the rest of the integrated software. So it allows us this flexibility to plug and play and take the best of all the programs we have out there without having to really um, create one monster program. We can make it be very flexible and modular. And we're really working hard to leverage tools in the global community. So as I mentioned, these are our partners. We're working most directly with them. But we're also working very closely with Excellence in Breeding with Module 3 for the volume pricing for genotyping and Module 5, which is, uh, occupies the same software and bioinformatics space that we're operating in. We're also connected with the Feed the Future Innov Innovation Lab for crop improvement. And so we'll be working with them on technology adoption and also on interoperability of different software modules. And lastly, we're also working with a group in Tokyo that's creating a similar type of uh, platform stack for small breeders, specialty breeders in Japan. So we do have public ask access to our BI development efforts. Um, they're listed here and I'll make these slides available as a PDF. So if you want to download it and, and use the, the link to click on it, or you can just, you know, go there now. Um, and it has a couple of different um, parts to that uh, repository. So our, our API is there, the web interface for Breeding Insight, and also the Java-based RESTful client for BRAPI. So I've talked mostly about software in the last few minutes, um, but outside of software, you might be asking, well, what else can BI do? Well, we've used our budget, which was intended for some of this purpose, to expand the applications of the markers that are already available in two species. So grape already had markers and rainbow trout already had markers. Um, but for whatever reasons, probably usually cost, they were not able to genotype um, at the depth that they were hoping for. So in grapevine, we, we re-genotyped 7,000 grape accessions from the national repositories. And so now that data is becoming available for breeders all over the world for pre-breeding and breeding efforts. In rainbow trout, the average cost of a sample on the 50K array is $50 a sample. So this really hamstringed the program and they were not able to um, actually genotype very effectively. Small pools of 100, it was the maximum. So by finding a different provider, we've been able to lower that cost and allow them to use that to greater depth in their program. 
For the other four um, that we're working with, market development's underway. Uh, alfalfa, blueberry, and salmon have all been submitted to DART for DART tag uh, targeted mar uh, marker technology, and sweet potatoes following up behind that. And we were we have the ability to do a little bit of testing and research with this to try to find really a, a very good solution for polyploids. And the reason why we hope we've uh, made a good decision is, is partly because of what EIB has been showing for white potato or Irish potato and the success of dart tag there. So we feel very good that this is a, a, a solid methodology that will work just as well for diploids as it does for polyploids. So again, um, one of our platforms is this mid-density dart tag system, and we're targeting between one to 4,000 markers um, per species, depending on what the genome size is and what the breeding program needs are. And we're working again with the same vendors you may be very familiar with. So Intertech for DNA extraction and dart tag for um, the gene uh, sequencing and genotyping. And Intertech, we're having to work with them on different kinds of animals like fish fin, fin clips and weevils and other kinds of non-plant origins of DNA. So they've been very helpful to work with us. And we hope that by buying into this technology and this platform that we can help lower the cost globally of those services by increasing the volume of, of samples coming into DART and Intertech. Uh, the other thing we also do is we meet with our breeders and help them integrate their phenomics tools. So for uh, sweet potato, our, our breeder is using a Phenospex plant eye scanner that is allowing him to look at the amount of insect damage that's occurring in any of his, uh, the tubers that are being harvested. But it also gives a lot more data than that. It gives length, width, volume, area, tuber grade, and counts, which would take a lot of time to do all of these independently. And the insect damage is like is generally just uh, an observation, but now you can actually look at it as a percentage of total area. So it's much more quantitative, much more suitable to genomic selection applications than just some kind of linear scale. In vineyards, um, vines stay out there for five years or more, and sometimes they die, and sometimes you replant, and you you don't you want to be able to recollect multiple types of data on on um, the grapevines multiple times per year. They're perennials. So we've been using uh, the Fieldbook app uh, with our grape readers. Um, they can have their traits preloaded, the fields preloaded. Uh, they can collect photographs. A lot of what we like about table grapes is the way they look. So they can collect that information right then when they're in the field. They can make free text notes with the tablet. And also it has a barcode scanner. So it's one stop carrying of, of a tool to help them do all the things that they would be doing with a, with a camera and paper and pencil and another person usually. Okay. So we provide a number of different services and we're doing a pretty good job of, of getting better at most of the ones that are listed as good. I would almost say we're excellent because we've, we've done marker development for three species already. Um, and you can see that there's a couple of things that we're still working on, on filling the gap for, and that is mostly with, re with relationship to phenotyping and uh, genomic selection support. And that's because we have not been able to hire a phenomics coordinator um, since we've started this program a year and a half ago. So we're still actively looking. Um, we, we think we will be able to fill that position within the next six months, and that will certainly change these back um, to a new state of good, and we'll, we'll really start working in earnest on those uh, activities with our breeders. And as I mentioned, I didn't talk about animal, uh, animal welfare data management because I figured most people here were probably crop people, but that's something that we recognized by visiting there that we would not have realized the breeders needed had we not gone there had we not actually stepped foot into those, um, those par rooms and, and the fisheries uh, and talked to them about what is this whiteboard here for? So we learned a lot about that by just being on campus with them. And we're working on uh, figuring out what the requirements are for that. So what's next for BI? Well, really our first year and a half was a lot of hiring. As you can see, we have a pretty big team. Um, and we had to do a lot of traveling. We met with breeders. Um, I was spending time connecting with EIB whenever possible because I, I don't want to duplicate efforts and I want to work collaboratively with the BI, the EIB uh, module five and module threes. 
And also at the beginning of this year, we conducted our first field book workshop for the grape breeders at their Vitus Gen meeting. Right now, we're really working on uh, building those genomic resources for our species. Uh, we have sweet potatoes still to do. Um, the other three are, are on, uh, as I mentioned, were already submitted. And our, tech, our BI software team is really working on a lot of software development. And we've been very lucky because COVID-19 happened after we've met most of our breeders and gave us time to kind of um, work on other things that were more amenable to work from home situations. So uh, we've been very fortunate to continue our work at nearly 100% uh, keep capacity since COVID started. And in the future, next, uh, next year, either quarter one or quarter two, we expect to get five new species. I'm using a honeybee as an example, but it's not been decided exactly what is going to be the next five species. And that will restart our genomic and other scientific aspects of, of onboarding those new species. Um, next year, we expect to have deployment and trainings uh, for our software, and then hopefully adding new tools as we move out. You can see from what the species we're working on now that we don't have any animals with legs yet. So we fully expect that our software is not going to meet all the needs for all the species um, right out the gate. We're gonna need more time to uh, figure out what those requirements are and the management practices and make sure that the software can adapt to that and use it. We're also expanding some uh, pre-work activities um, in the southeast area of the ARS. So the USDA uh, has carved up the United States into five large major areas. The southeast is one of those areas. And this is Amanda Hulse Kemp, and she's in Raleigh, North Carolina. And she's running a program called Breeding Insight OnRamp, or BI OnRamp. And this is for the southeast area commodity groups that are interested in moving into a BI uh, more formal agreement um, in the future, but need a little preparation time, need a little time to get their files in order, collect their community. And she's expecting about a two year commitment for any groups that would like to do this um, in preparation to come into BI. And the benefits really is it allows the community to organize um, by itself earlier than we can help them do once they get into BI. Um, we can establish uh, the breed-based database sooner, and they can ar start archiving data that's important to them much earlier. And Amanda's there to give advice on how to structure programs to fast track them to the breeding insight selection stage. So the way this looks in, in graphical form is that the first year or two, um, it takes a little bit of time to kind of organize and on-ramp people, so it kind of builds up uh, over time. And then by the time uh, they're leaving BI on ramp, they're ready to come into Breeding Insight and we'll be able to move much more efficiently and quickly with that group because they've done all the, the homework already. And right now we're, again, I mentioned we're in a pilot phase. So our ARS national program staff, um, we're really talking directly to the Office of National Programs at the USDA. And our, our liaison there has been extremely helpful in guiding our, our progress. And right now we're only really dealing with three out of 50 specialty crops the USDA breeds for. Um, only two animal species and only one natural resource. But our vision for the future really is to breed for all 50 of the specialty crops plus support the national plant germplasms banks uh, for pre-breeding activities. Uh, 15 animal species and uh, maybe 30 or more natural resource uh, species. In order to do that, we'd need more programs like what Amanda's running that are um, take our breeding insight coordinators more in a national distribution. And with that, I'm going to say thank you. Um, I just listed our, our points of contact with our ARS collaborators here uh, for the individual species and also for BI OnRamp. Again, our Office of National Programs at ARS has been instrumental in guiding us and finding us additional funding. Um, my staff, I hope is, if we ever get a chance to uh, meet in person again, that you'll get to meet some of them. And we have a really diverse uh, scientific advisory board that really helps us stay on track and make sure that we're thinking about the problems in the right mindset and framework. Um, you can find our GitHub on the, on the web here. And our funding and support comes from the USDA, uh, so the Department of Agriculture's Agricultural Research Service, and we're hosted at Cornell. 
And I'm happy to take any questions on anything if anybody has any. Thank you. Thank you very much to Moira for her excellent presentation. Um, I, I do not see any questions in the chat uh, yet, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask them. Hi, Maura. This is Francisco Gomez. I'm a faculty at Michigan State University. Hi. Hi, this is my first year uh, at Michigan State University. I'm a, a new dry bean breeder here. Uh, what? Dry bean? Dry bean breeder, yeah. Bean breeder. yeah. Okay. Uh, Phaseolus vulgaris. Yeah, okay. So we are just starting to ramp up on collecting phenomic data, uh, hopefully some genomic data as well. And we're, we use a lot of these apps already. We don't use the breed base because we use our uh, agro base, but mm -hmm. do you think there's going to be something similar to what Amanda Holskamp is doing at Raleigh that she can kind of, somebody in this region might be giving some insight into how to organize this data? Because we're starting to look at databases to store a lot of this data. Uh, is there something that's going to be for this particular area or would it be something that I could play around in the sandbox that you're going to have in the website? Yeah, I, I think the answer to that, both of those is yes. I mean, we're in the process of creating a lot of how-to um, documents, maybe some YouTube videos on how to get your traits organized, how to build an ontology. Um, uh, so we're working on creating some passive training modules now that we can't really travel. Uh, so we'll be making those public to anybody who's interested. Um, you don't have to be a USDA breeder to use the software, um, but you would be more responsible on your end to, to manage the system administration and, and such. But, you know, we'd still want to hear your feedback on how does the sandbox work for you and what's missing that is needed for, you know, or how, you know, what customized view that is not available that really needs to be. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So I, I see that there's a question from uh, from Michael Kanavi. Maybe if you if you'd like to um, voice it out loud, or I can read it out for everyone to hear. Sure, I can read it. So okay. when you allow breeders to compose new traits, does this follow an, an established ontology? So I'll answer that one first. It does, but there are some things that we've decided um, based on the crop ontologies. Um, it has a mega. I don't know if you've ever looked at the crop ontology. Uh, Excel sheet, but it's like 51 columns of information. And we've actually kind of pared it down to the ones we think are most important that the breeders really care about. So we are following it, but we're not using all the fields that are necessarily required. So for example, trait description often looks like a, sub, a subset of method description. What we really care about is a detailed method. So we are not importing the trait uh, description because it's already contained in the method description but with more information. So we are following it but we're trying to be very open-minded and flexible and if we have to break a few things and break the box a little bit to get it to work better, I think we're willing to do that because we're going to be doing this over and over again and I hate sending things to breeders as busy work. I'd rather get the information that's really critical to make sure that that trait is well understood, repeatable, you know, follows the fair data practices and also allows anybody who wants to use that trait to know exactly how to collect it so that data can be leveraged across groups. And the second question you asked, um, are you considering having someone keep an eye on trait ontologies? Well, the one thing that we've decided to do is we've put the ontologies into our breeders' hands and we've allowed them to make a decision. They can either privatize their trait ontology list, which means they use all the traits, they create all the traits, but nobody else really needs to use them or see them. Or they could work with a group of other breeders to build out a public ontology. And that is something that is an optional because it does take so long to do that we don't want that to hold up the ability to collect data today. So that's why we've kind of, we've taken, instead of making one public ontology, we kind of have a breeder's control of their own ontology at their location. We have blueberries being bred for you pick. We have blueberries being bred for frozen juice. We have blueberries, you know, being, you know, uh, harvested just me mechanically. Some are being hand picked and they have different traits associated. So it doesn't make sense that the person who's doing mechanical harvesting see all the stuff about hand, hand picking. You know, we don't want to overload the ontology. So that's how we're kind of going is that we're taking it, allowing the breeder to have 
control over their ontology to archive traits to to share out when they want, but not make that a requirement. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I was coming from the background that uh, several breeders could have, uh, several breeders for the same uh, crop could have the different methodologies for the same trait, the phenotyping. So they probably, do. yes, true. But uh, some uh, methodologies are more repeatable than others. So probably if you could have a way of getting them communicate to each other and adopt a more workable, more repeatable methodology for given a trait, wouldn't that be better? Well, we have done that. So when we, for grape, it's a great example for downy mildew. Um, some, some people, uh, the guy who, our pathologist, he has a lot of traits that he collects for powdery, powdery mildew and they're all important to him. But the breeders only have one or two. One person scoring it on a whole plant, one to four, and another person's looking at it by plant type, like leaf, uh, rachis, um, vine, etc. And they're doing a one to five. They're probably pretty similar, but to, to make sure that they don't accidentally try to use data that's not 100% aligned, we want to make sure that we articulate those traits separately. If they decide later on, we should you know, this is too many traits, we really need to, you know, all agree on it. They can, they're going to have to self-organize. We can help them with that, but we're not making it a requirement. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm a data manager with NextGen Project. Um, we use BreadBase. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Okay. Um, next question, let's see. Um, okay. What are the main challenges you face regarding deploying phenotyping technologies with your breeders? The biggest challenge is that they are, the way the funding works at the ARS, they get a yearly amount of money. And if they don't spend it, it goes away. So a lot of what we see happening is that they get to the close to the end of year and they've got $20,000 and somebody at a tech fair says, oh, you should use this technology and they buy it. And it's really, if, if we'd had more time or help with that, we would have made a different decision. So now we're trying to figure out how to make a system that isn't really meant for what they're asking it to do and, and still make it work. So what would be better is that if we could hear what they need and then find a technology solution that's appropriate to that rather than the other way around. So that's our biggest problem right now is that this Phenospex is okay, but it can't be used in the field. It has to sit in a, in a I mean, it's still a lot of manual labor getting this done. It's faster than one person doing it, but not a, not a ton faster data is more accurate, but at the cost of not being able to do as many accessions. So that's, that would be my, my biggest take home is that if we can get to breeders before they buy that big piece of software or big piece of technology, that we can have some uh, help in vetting that technology for the, the actual purpose. Okay, even did that answer your question? Okay. Um, I also have another question. Dart markers. Is this the same with the Dart Seek markers from the Diversity Ray of Australia? It's the same company, but it's not a GBS based. So it's not random markers. These are targeted loci. So Dart Tag requires that you have actual genome sequence um, to make targeted markers. So we're actually going to be hitting the same markers generation after generation. And the benefit of doing it this way is that once we have genetic maps, we can use those markers uh, to do genomic selection uh, based on genetic distance rather than on physical distance. Um, if I didn't answer your question, you can just pipe in. Okay, um, my concern, uh, this is from Dr. Kalule. My concern is how will how the database will start to talk to each other, keeping in mind the encompassing policies. So um, I think maybe there's a little bit of a disconnect between what the CGR has to do or for their funding and through Bill and Melinda Gates than what the ARS is requiring. We're very fortunate we have one stakeholder, the ARS. So we can employ whatever um, interoperability or we can deploy it wherever we want. Right now it's on AWS, but we wanted to deploy it on the ARS's intranet, um, we could hand that over to them for that uh, work. So I'm not sure what you mean by policies, but um, because all of the USDA data is technically public, all we're doing is uh, putting data in private 
areas for a time being to allow the breeders to have a competitive advantage over their other breeders um, before they publish. If I didn't answer your question, if I got it wrong, let me know. Okay, um, next question from Kadir Hamad. With changing climate, what should breeders do? Uh, just developing early climate resistant varieties is, in, is not enough. Um, can you, can you uh, I guess, suggest any strategies for the future? Um, this is a problem for major crops as well as minor crops and specialty crops. And, and there really isn't uh, a good answer to that because um, even in New York, we're shit seeing that our seasons are lengthening, but now there's new pests that are coming up from the South that we never had to deal with before. So I, I feel one of the ways we have been trying to build in resilience in our breeders program is by allowing them to make these trait on, create new traits as soon as they see an immediate need for it, or they wanna start testing to see how heritable uh, a disease uh, resistance might be or, or et cetera. So part of it is, is that, Part of it is also coming back to pre-breeding and trying to uh, diversify and bring more, more of those undomesticated but neutral genes into breeding materials such that you have a little bit more of a genetic base to uh, select when, when extreme conditions happen. The thing about extreme conditions is you can't really create them, they just happen. And that's how a lot of breeding for drought tolerance is just the one thing that was left in the field after everything was you know, under drought stress for two months and it's still okay. I mean, not great, but it's alive. So that individual was picked as being drought tolerant or drought resistant to a point and now is used for breeding downstream. So I think the more diversity you can put out in your early populations and you know, given with the climate change, you might have these, these uh, pressure events happening more frequently, you may build yourself a little bit more of a buffer to make selections that you wouldn't actually be able to see any other way if you keep your your germplasm de de base diverse. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know if there's any other question. Oh wait. Uh, I have one from Bodo T. Can people from outside suggest to the BI team ideas for further automated phenotyping? Example, estimate yield by image analysis of plots, dug up potatoes covering some of the ground, whom to contact? This is a fantastic question. And um, if I had a phenomics person, that would be the person I would actually have you talk directly to. But um, we are interested in knowing how how your image uh, analysis is working and if there's an opportunity for us to see it in action or watch a YouTube video, that would be the best way in this given age to, to share that knowledge out. Um, if you're also working with a breeder at the USDA, uh, the potato breeder at the USDA, might be a good way to talk with them too. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is because our program, the breeders are the breeding programs are very small at the ARS for specialty species. So for sweet potato, there's one breeder for all of ARS, one breeder. And so he, in order to make, to leverage what's available in the community, he has a lot of public partners that he works with. Uh, the Sweet Gains Project, um, Craig Gensho at NC State, um, Don Labonte down in uh, uh, Louisiana. And together, they're able to make his program even bigger than it would be if it was just him. So that uh, we find that a lot of our public breeder or our ARS breeders have these public contacts with other public breeders. So if you have any connection with um, the ARS potato breeder, I would definitely reach out through that, that stream too. You can always email me too and I can try to figure out where to, who, who can help you with it too. Okay. Okay, I have a question from Star. Are the USDA breeding programs required to store their breeding data in BreedBase through the BI Sandbox portal? No, the Sandbox portal is really, um, it's not, it's data that's purged periodically. It's just for user testing and visibility and, and workflow setting. Um, but they are required to make all of their data um, publicly uh, available if they ever get asked by the Freedom of Information Act. 
all ARS data is essentially public. It's allowed to be private for periods of time prior to publication because that does prevent misusage of data and it allows the, bre the breeders to publish, which is part of their job description. So they have to publish. So um, they're not required to do any of it. They are storing it on Excel, on hard drives, in notebooks. They're not, none of this has been told to them by the ARS. They have to do it a particular way. So we're trying to bring some regularization to that process and secure that data better. And your second question, is the BI team able to, is that BI team to en enable the plug and play for other breeding data management systems? Um, indirectly, yes. So what we are hoping to do is, is encourage BRAPI compliancy by the individual um, software groups. So GDR, um, so Dory Main's group, if she can work on getting it up to BRAPI 2.0 or 3.0 compliance, that's that falls under her IT direction, not ours. Um, but if there are points of collaboration where we need something from Breedbase and it's to our benefit to, to do that change to Breedbase, we will do that in conjunction with them and, and make it known to them and ask them um, to in integrate any kinds of changes that we've made uh, to give more functionality. Okay. Any other questions? These are great questions. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, it, it looks like there are no other questions in, in chat. Any last questions that anyone would, would like to, to pose before we bring the session to a close? Okay, hearing none, then I would just like to, to thank Moira once again for, for joining us, for presenting, and, and for giving us an uh, excellent uh, update on the Breeding Insight Project. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here, and I hope that I'll uh, have a contact with you guys sometime in the future, maybe even in person. <laughs> so thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. All right. Bye everyone. Thank you, Adam and Star, for your help and Kate for your introduction. I didn't mean to forget that. <laughs> no, th thank you so much. And we look forward to being in contact with all of you. Thank you for participating, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay.